All right, the last topic for period three, and that's gonna be about uh, culture, uh, as far as how the arts were impacted by all these philosophical uh, ideas and scientific discoveries uh, and responses uh, to those. So uh, we're looking at uh, roughly, of course, 1815 to 1914, so I'll probably use that as a specific time span. Actually, I'll start at 1800, just to make it nicer. Uh, and extend that all the way through uh, till about, probably not a very straight line. Uh, well, we'll go to 1920 as the cutoff. Uh, but just notice period three itself is gonna be 1815 to 14. So the first major movement we have um, as neoclassical, uh, neoclassical styles start to uh, wane, still exist, but still but start to wane, is the Romantic movement. That was the strongest movement uh, going forward. And that's gonna run up until probably about the 1890s uh, or so. So over here actually. So this will be 1900-ish. And that'll be about 1850. Yeah. About 1875, 1825. So keep in mind, this above. Keep in mind, uh, there's no exact dates on these movements, but uh, we'll say roughly, uh, this is where romanticism is gonna run. Uh, so let's get some characteristics of that, which we've talked about before, but I'll give a little more detail on that. So Romanticism. All right, so I mentioned this in period two, um, but that was more of a transition uh, as, as Romanticism began. This one's gonna be much more uh, embodied or characterized uh, in the 19th century. <clears throat> so Romanticism, uh, that is gonna be largely a uh, response, a reaction, a counter-reaction, and it is counter-enlightenment, uh, along with these German idealistic philosophers, uh, a response to uh, uh, enlightenment emphasis on reason, uh, science, and um, and as the the uh, as the decades go on, uh, the industrial revolution. And uh, this is going to really start to genuinely dislike uh, synthetic things, um, things that are society related. Uh, or our science knowledge related, uh, rationality related, and it's really gonna emphasize the natural. So uh, not the synthetic or the man-made, but the natural. So uh, down, synthetic, slash man-made, uh, and up with the uh, natural uh, and intuitive. So natural to them is you're born and your feelings are natural, but thinking and planning is not uh, necessarily natural. Um, so they highlight those. So good, uh, and then of course that would be the, the bad um, for the uh, Romantic era. So some examples of our characteristics. Um, let's get, uh, obviously it's gonna be focused a lot on nature. Uh, it's also gonna be focused on intuition. So you, you'll probably remember some of these themes from the German philosophers I mentioned of Nietzsche. Uh, feeling, emotion, emotion, uh, passion, but also, part of this nature to tradition, um, it's going to be very um, nationalistic. Uh, in fact, uh, this is when national histories are gonna begin. Uh, begin. So they don't just look at history, let's knock the table over there. They don't just look at history as in like a sequence of events that happened, but like leading up to something great. And the something great is like their nation state or their nation, whether it's Germany or France or whatever it might be. Uh, and so these histories are kind of defined by that, where they highlight the, 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 the notable points of growth for their nation, uh, or they um, uh, talk about the defeats of, of, of others, or, or you know, eras where they were you know, uh, downtrodden for whatever reason, but then they rose up after you know, this many years in this event, in this war, whatever it might be. So they become increasingly nationalistic for history, um, talk about the superiority of theirs, and they try to kind of indoctrinate people with like, you know, um, the Pledge of Allegiance, um, the, the national songs, the flags, things like that uh, emerge and become uh, popular, uh, even in the US, as this bleeds over to US as well. So what we're looking for, and this is a sign of kind of the, the, the times here as far as that response to the Enlightenment, coming out of mostly Germany and France, but spreading to England and the US as well, uh, we want some specific examples of people or works that embody these themes or some of these themes. So. Um, for Romanticism, at least, the uh, College Board wants us to look at uh, visual arts, at music, or compositions anyway, 
And then, um, what's the other category? Oh, literature. So we'll do that. Let's do visual art first. So we have um, in Spain a guy named Francisco Goya. And in, um, I'll put box around that, it's actually. Uh, Francisco Goya. And we've also got a guy named uh, Friedrich, or Casper Friedrich, my bad. Just got that backwards. Casper. Uh, these are both quite famous painters. I guarantee you've seen their paintings before. What I'll do when I I'm, I'm actually put this video up is I'll at least briefly put images of their art because that really helps you understand it. Um, but I'll first talk about this. So Francisco Goya, uh, a Spanish, I wouldn't say he's purely a nationalist, but he definitely has some tones, at least at times, especially when they accuse him of being pro-French. Uh, he, he does his best to uh, demonstrate that he's not. So after uh, Spain has... Uh, along with the help of Britain, chased or France out of uh, Spain, the peninsula, um, after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, and the dust has sort of settled. Um, people were much more nationalistic in Spain, especially their opposition to uh, French nationalism in France. Uh, so to kind of commemorate that, but also to show the, the atrocities of the war, uh, he made several paintings that sort of embody this nationalistic spirit, this anti-French spirit in Spain, uh, with the, um, what was it called? It was, I think it was called the the 2nd of May, uh, 1808. Uh, and also another painting of uh, the 3rd of May, 1808. And in both cases, this is showing uh, brutal instances from those Peninsulari Wars between France and Spain, as they're occupied by France, obviously, and, they, and they've put into place this, uh, this uh, French uh, monarch or pro-French monarch, and then they relatively detest it in Spain. Uh, and of course the British are there trying to, to, to combat the French as well. And he sort of embodies that anti-French sentiment uh, and pro-Spain nationalist sentiment with these paintings which are showing French soldiers and, and, and Spanish soldiers and, and the atrocities that they're involved in. Casper uh, Friedrich is a, a bit more clear, um, at least concise. Uh, so this, that was, you would definitely characterize this as nationalistic. And when you see the picture, by the way, it's, it's rather captivating as far as uh, it's uh, gripping you with uh, its emotion and, and feel. As, because you can see the expressions and the actions that are committed in these atrocities. Friedrich was also nationalistic, but he focused a lot more on the nature part of it as well. Um, so a lot of his are landscape themed, uh, but German landscape specifically. So it's mostly wooded, um, generally rather darker and gray, because Germany just sort of is um, characterized by that sort of weather, not the people, but the weather. Um, and he's also going to include some uh, uh, German mythology in there as well. Or I wouldn't say mythology, but some German architecture, like ancient German architecture, like Germanic roots, uh, not the uh, ones that are influenced by other cultures, but ones that are what they would at least consider purely Germanic. Um, as well as uh, some uh, that focus more on the individual person's quest uh, in combination with nature, because this is, the landscapes are clearly uh, nature and then including German, ancient German architecture, nationalistic. Uh, but he's also going to encompass some of these emotions along with the nature by his well, one, I don't know if it's the most famous, but it's one of the most, it's, uh, it's called like Observer Over the Fog or something like that, or Man Over the Sea of Fog, something along those lines. I can't remember the exact title, it'll be in the actual video. Uh, but yeah, you have, uh, I think it's Over, Observer overseeing the fog or something like that. The Sea of Fog. Uh, it's a pretty famous uh, romantic um, uh, portrait. So those are, are, are good examples of those and then I'll have pictures of them too. Um, for music, so let's make a break there. For music, uh, composers uh, that we could use. You could use, you could use Beethoven. He was a transitional uh, person. You could use some of his sympathies or his symph symphonies. Um, but I think some more clear examples would probably be um, Tchaikovsky's a great one. Oh, Richard Wagner too. So Wagner, Richard Wagner, Richard Wagner. Uh, he's German, uh, so he composes uh, a lot of music that is uh, very German uh, focused, I'll say. So they're gonna have a lot of themes of, from German mythology and Nordic mythology. Uh, and it's very uh, a sort of nationalistic tone to these operas and performances that he composes. Uh, nationalistic, uh, and that's easy uh, to uh, to capture um, in music. Is this sort of uh, I guess you could say cultural 
uh, emphasis. You can include your cultural instruments, instruments and sounds, and you can do it in a manner that expresses your support of them or your enthusiasm about them. Uh, so another one that's based on enthusiasm was a Russian composer. I forget his first name, but his last name was Tchaikovsky, which I'm probably going to butcher here. Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. I'm probably spelling that wrong. All of it's spelled right on the screen. Uh, but he's a Russian uh, nationalist composer. And this doesn't uh, describe or characterize all of his works, but he has one that's very famous, uh, which is that overture of 1812 uh, to celebrate uh, the German vic sorry, the uh, Russian victory over Napoleonic France uh, in 1812. So that's the one with the cannons. The -na 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 -na. That's that one. Uh, very, very popular. And the first one to use cannons and bells like that. All right, for literature, uh, there's going to be a range here as well. You could use guys like Johann Fichte and his nationalistic writings. In fact, let's actually just put that up there. Johann Fichte, the German nationalist. German nationalist poet. Uh, you could also use examples like, um, uh, for nature, you could use Mary Shelley, um, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, and some other famous father who is a writer too, but I forgot his name. Wasn't famous enough for me. Uh, Mary Shelley, uh, she wrote the book of Frankenstein. And that book's actually a pro-nature book, um, at least for part of it for the analysis. It's basically what she's suggesting by the book is um, when we try to play God with science, we end up with an abomination, and ultimately nature cannot be corralled, understood, or harnessed the way that, uh, you know, um, arrogant men think that they can. Men meaning just humanity, but she does only use men. It's like in Frankenstein, he does recreate or reanimate this, uh, this abomination, um, and it comes to life, but it ends up being troublesome, and uh, he's not able to control it, and ultimately it, it, it leads to his, uh, to his death, this, this monster, uh, for Dr. Frankenstein. So that's a, that's a, a pro-nature, anti-science, pro-nature, anti-science. Uh, composition. What's another one that we could talk about? Um, oh, yeah, what, another German. How about, um, uh, I think his name is, first name is Johan. Goethe. Goethe. There we go. Goethe. Or Goethe. Uh, there's only a slight difference in the German pronunciation, and I'm not sure exactly which one it is. But that implies it's an umlaut, so it'd be Goethe. So, Goethe. Uh, he's going to be a um, uh, novelist. So that's actually, novels are kind of neoclassical um, uh, enlightenment, but he's going to kind of be like a little bit like a, a, a Beethoven as a transitional from classical, neoclassical to romantic. Uh, Goethe's going Goethe's to function uh, similarly as a uh, romantic novelist. Uh, and the themes for his are heavily emotional. Uh, so themes of, of, of love and lust, and, but not just like, oh, I love her and I want her, but to the point that like, um, he's willing to risk his life or commit suicide, uh, depending on the, uh, the novel he's writing, the characters, uh, since they're so overwhelmed by this, this, this compassion, this intuitive pull and drive to, to be with this person. So that's, that's what's essentially going to embody romanticism, and that provides you with some examples as well. So there's romanticism. The next set of movements is going to, because uh, obviously neoclassical uh, thoughts are going to sort of wane here, neoclassical, uh, and we have a, a sort of resurgence. Uh, but with this big anti-enlightenment um, set of movements uh, under Romanticism, you're going to have another sort of uh, retaliation or, or response by those uh, more enlightenment-focused uh, type people. So this is sort of more the classical liberal response. Not necessarily all classical liberals, but this is more liberal than um, um, the more nature-oriented ones that are, that are anti-science. Um, so these folks uh, are what we call the realists, and you could say they start in the late, teen, late 1840s and goes to about the 1860s. So that's romanticism, this long stretch here. Uh, this is realism. And um, I should have a different color, at least for that, so you can kind of distinguish it a little bit. 
Oh, it's just wiped out romanticism on accident. Romanticism. Okay. Uh, and then realism is going to be late 1840s uh, to probably the 1860s, roughly speaking, you could say. That comes to a close. Uh, but this is the uh, response to the response, kind of. So what really embodies romanticism, and a lot of these uh, counter-enlightenment German French uh, philosophers is they're incredibly, and I've mentioned this before, and actually not even just them, even the positivists from uh, you know, the Anglo-American world, whether they were counter-enlightenment or pro-enlightenment, they were both very idealistic in that they believed there was a right way to do something. Obviously Nietzsche's gonna sort of break that apart, but even he believed that there was sort of a best way to go about it, and that there's, there's this, this uh, inner feeling that you should be pursuing or this uh, objective knowledge you should be pursuing whatever the person is in perspective, they had this ideal version of what all people should believe, right? And then Nietzsche, of course, is the one that says, no, it's a perspective based on you, know, you and your psychological needs, but nonetheless. So you could characterize romanticism as very idealistic and uniform, so that all people should believe these things, or that's the right way to do things. It's kind of objectively driven. Um, here we have a little less of that. Uh, and as we get into the late uh, 1800s, the, the 19th century, late 19th century, uh, you're gonna start seeing some of those influences from philosophy and science as they start to question and break down uh, what uh, objective knowledge or universal responses or, or, or truths are. Uh, you're gonna see that reflected uh, in, in culture too. So this very much embodies the positivist or the uh, German uh, counter-enlightenment uh, idealist uh, movements uh, because and it fits with those because it is also idealistic in form just like positivism and, and neoclassicalism and all that was. Uh, realism is where it kind of starts to break away from that idealistic tone uh, and then when it starts getting to like the modern themes of post-impressionism and cubism and that matches up with the science and the philosophy of the time really well uh, we'll see that. So realism is kind of the first step away from this idealistic uh, outlook. So we'll detail realism here. Realism and then we'll say 1840s-ish to 1860s, it's waned. I should put the years here too, 1800 to 1890. Uh, and realists are kind of uh, defined by that. Uh, and, it, and it's in their name, realist. Uh, they prefer or emphasize uh, realistic uh, interpretations. Uh, of the world and subjects, so the, the subjects they're actually painting. These are more so fo focused on this ideal perfect version of nature or the nation or national history or hero. Uh, that's what it's centered on. This is not that at all. It's not focusing on any sort of ideal, uh, perfect, heroic imaging. Uh, it's going to be focused on the real, the plain, and it's not going to exclude details uh, just because they're unpleasant. So uh, they're very realistic. Uh, they're going to focus on uh, regular, ordinary uh, topics and people. They'll offer criticisms, too, of society, realizing, so like, if I was a, a romantic poet or writer and I'm writing about my nation, Germany or whatever it might be, I'm probably not going to criticize them, if at all, it's going to be about some, how it was some, you know, meaningful uh, experience that made the nation or people stronger, or whatever it would be. This is not saying that this is going to be uh, uh, critical uh, of society, specifically industrial society. So materialism, industrial. So it's like, oh yeah, so an example might be like, yeah, we have these wonderful things, but it's super polluted and dark and people are still suffering and you know, working in the factories is terrible and there's lots of poverty and crime still. So it's like, okay, it's getting better, but look, it's still uh, got a lot of um, unpleasantness to it. So it's regular ordinary people, uh, it's critical of society, and then they're realistic. They're not afraid to, uh, uh, no censorship of unpleasant. So if it's unpleasant, it doesn't matter, they're still gonna show it. So. Uh, topics that they cover. Or we'll just go right to the artists. Uh, we'll go uh, visual arts, because uh, that's what the college board wants to do, so visual arts. Not arsts. Arts. The most famous one was kind of the first one to really to, to, to hedge this, I guess you could say, uh, or, or trailblaze it, rather. It would be uh, Claude Monet from France. Claude 
Monet. Sorry, I'm thinking of Impressionism. Gustave Courbet. Gustave Courbet, still French though. Uh, the the uh, uh, Claude Monet is the next one's Impressionism. Uh, Gustave Courbet, uh, he is going to be an artist who uh, uh, really abides by these. So his topic should be regular, ordinary people. So just industrial workers, peasants, uh, not extravagant heroes or wealthy people or successful people. And he's going to make it, it's not quite what we call photorealism, where people are painting so accurately it looks like a real picture. But uh, we're starting to get photography now um, in the mid-19th century and onwards. So uh, actual pictures are, are a part of uh, the realist movement. Uh, but even the paintings are, are meant to be very detailed, have one perspective and one meaning. Like here's me looking at uh, these one, this one called stone miners. Like you'll see the stone miners I'll put up on the screen. Uh, of these very realistic actual guys just actually sitting there uh, doing their job, uh, or peasants. Uh, it's going to be, again, not quite photorealism, but you'll see they're very realistic in their portrayals and accurate. Um, so accurate, real portrayals. Uh, so you've got themes uh, and titles. These titles might be wrong, but we'll have it corrected on the um, uh, actual video uh, of stone miners or stone workers. Uh, and then, of course, peasants. For literature, this college board also wants us to know some examples for literature. Uh, by the way, you don't have to know all of these examples for the uh, next two movements, but for these two movements, they do want you to know specific uh, art, music, and literature, and for realism, art, and then literature. Literature, you've definitely heard of this guy, uh, Charles Dickens. English? And uh, he's going to be uh, one who is going to be critical of society in his literary works. So you definitely know at least one of them, probably two, uh, but you definitely know the one. Uh, you've all heard of or read or watched movies or versions of A Christmas Carol. Whether it's The Muppets or not, I don't know. Uh, but this one was, I don't know if it's most famous, but probably one of the most well-known here in the United States. But the whole Ebenezer Scrooge thing and being too greedy and you know having this vision of his life and... Uh, him changing his ways, not being too greedy. It's very anti-materialistic. Uh, so that's one of the themes there, anti-materialistic. So that's got the social criticism, uh, but it's also got a very realistic sense of, of what things are like, and it's got a bunch of ordinary people in it. Uh, there's no heroes. Uh, he's a bad dude, and the other people are just kind of regular people. Uh, I guess you could say Tiny Tim might be a pretty idealistic person, but uh, nonetheless, he shows a wide spectrum of people, focuses on the poverty, and then, uh, of course, criticizes them for being excessively greedy and materialistic in the industrial uh, and commercial uh, era. Uh, another one that he uh, has is um, called Great Expectations, where uh, you have this um, character, Pip, who is uh, semi-adopted by this uh, wealthy aristocratic family, and he's expecting them, of course, to be wonderful, stupendous, wise, wealthy uh, people, and they turn out to be a bunch of um, uh, very shallow, uh, imperfect, corrupted, um, and manipulative uh, people who are just generally terrible as far as their, um, their, their visions of, of life, their actions, and their treatment of other people. Uh, so it, it paints a very realistic uh, and critical picture of, um, of elitism. And, uh, and nobility, certainly. Okay, cool. So that's realism. Next, we got, and I'm running out of room here, so I'm probably going to erase some of this realist, realism stuff. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. Uh, we've got three more movements, but I'll go over them more quickly because I don't have to go over as many examples for them. Uh, just to give you an example. So that's realism. So you've got romanticism, idealistic, and now we start to break away from the idealistic a little bit with realism, uh, and now we're going to really start breaking away. Uh, from realistic and more towards the abstract and uh, sort of uh, themes of not being idealistic or achievable but um, uh, subjective uh, to multiple interpretations. So don't quite start that yet here but we, we kind of started so we'll I'll use red. Uh, so the 1870s and 1880s were kind of uh, dominated by uh, Impressionism. And this is going to be um, largely driven uh, by, he's not the only one, but probably the most famous, uh, Impressionism, uh, by uh, Claude Monet, the guy I mentioned before, accidentally out of order. Uh, so that's going to be 1870s to 1880s, roughly speaking. Uh, and uh, one example is Claude Monet. 
So before I give you these examples, uh, let's get some characteristics of this movement. So it's going to be just like realism in that it's going to emphasize um, emphasizes the following uh, regular themes and people. That's going to be the same. So you're going to have some landscapes. It's going to be some just basic people. There's no really idealistic people or heroes or anything like that. Um, but the styles can be different. So I, I go away from this very realistic approach to a less realistic uh, painting. So they do actually highlight some things realistically, but, but some less. And I'll, I'll show you. So uh, it's characterized by these uh, light, uh, thin brush strokes. So it's going to be low on the detail, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to emphasize something else besides just the detail. Uh, their emphasis here emphasize uh, two qualities, and that is one, uh, realistic lighting, and these Impressionists and later Post-Impressionists have some of the best uh, works as far as, as, as overall beauty and splendor goes uh, for capturing that um, lighting as far as uh, how it hits human faces, how it uh, hits landscapes and sunrises. They do a great job of that. Uh, realistic lighting, and here's kind of the moving away from the uh, objective universal knowledge and perspective. They're not gonna be standing still, and all the paintings we're talking about, people are pretty much standing still. It's like a it's a caption uh, or, a, or a screenshot of a, of a specific a moment, moment or event in time. Uh, not so much so with Impressionism. It's going to be focused more on movement. So again, uh, regular people, are, people that continues, but the brush strokes are going to be uh, different. They're not going to be as accurate. Uh, they're a specific style, but it's going to be realistic portrayals of lighting and movement are going to be central themes. So Claude Monet, uh, the Impressionist painter that helped start this movement. Uh, probably the most uh, well-known for him uh, would be Sunrise or Impressionism. It's called Impressionism or Impressionism, uh, Sunrise. And I'll put some other ones up there of him, but that's a specific work uh, and, you'll, and you'll kind of see what I mean. And that's gonna be popular for a couple decades, but then the uh, younger crowd comes along and changes it slightly and makes it more, and you could say Impressionism, but certainly post-Impressionism, we start this transition to modern art. One that is not focused on a single perspective or a realistic portrayal, but it's really trying to capture something else, whether it's trying to show multiple perspectives and meanings, or it's trying to uh, show the meaning through abstract portrayals. So like people that don't look exactly like people, but they'll distort the picture to try to send a, uh, a message or a meaning or, 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 or emphasize some sort of, of expression. Like you're trying to make people look sad, you would use different colors. You might even distort the face and the expression to, to, uh, to make that point or make it clear. So post-impressionism is gonna follow from roughly the 1880s up to the early, very early 1900s, post-impressionism. And there's a lot of similarities, which is why it kind of shares the name, but this, this new generation of Impressionist painters do correctly uh, get a distinguishing uh, post added to it because it is slightly different. So post-Impressionism. And by the way, the next thing we're gonna talk about are specific to visual arts, uh, at least what we're talking about. Post-Impressionism, uh, 1880s, or I'll even say 90s actually, 1890s to 1910 maybe or so. Uh, and uh, there's going to be some continuations, but what I'm going to say characterizes this is emphasizes the following. First of all, uh, they do have those characteristic thin brush strokes in Impressionism, and we're going to have a similar style, but the brush strokes are different, that they're thicker in, in width, but there's also going to lather on a lot more paint. So, like you're going to see the texture of the paint globbed on there. Uh, and if you can ever see any of a guy we're talking about named Van Gogh stuff, I've seen a couple of his real pieces. Uh, at the uh, San Francisco uh, Museum. They'll, they'll, they tour these things around the world usually. So if you ever get a chance to go see them, see them. Like they were way more, um, they blew me away. They were way better than any pictures I've ever seen in recreations. You go and see the real thing, it really actually makes you step back to realize how actually gorgeous these damn things are. So um, emphasizes a uh, thick globular uh, paint strokes. So that's a continuation. 
But here's where we get kind of uh, modern. And again, I, I would say here, roughly speaking, we get this uh, uh, transition to modern art. And modern art is going to be characterized by a couple of the themes that we mentioned in our um, uh, speaking about um, science and, and, and philosophy and psychology. Uh, modern art is going to be characterized by uh, abstract uh, features, so features that are not accurate uh, because, again, they don't believe there is such thing as a, an objective perception or view or perspective on something. So they'll, they'll intentionally distort things like human faces or buildings and things like that. So abstract uh, features. And, and colors, we'll talk about it here. Uh, they're also going to um, um, create works that are capable of being perceived from multiple perspectives, not just one. Like the stone miners, for example. It, well, I erased it. But it's very clear in that painting, like they're just two stone workers just doing their jobs, chiseling away at stone. There's not really any other way to interpret that. You could, I suppose, uh, but it's pretty one single, there, there's kind of a single meaning of perspective there. But they'll intentionally, increasingly as we go along, uh, uh, try to go away from a clear one perspective or meaning and try to open it up to, to multiple perspectives. So multiple perspectives and meaning uh, instead of one. And after World War I, and we get like Dadaism and, and Futurism and... Um, Expressionism, uh, particularly Dada, uh, you, you, you kind of get these intentionally antagonistic, uh, almost bitter uh, criticisms of what art and beauty and, and meaning and things like that are. But we haven't gotten there quite yet. We're just on the abstract portion. So thick globular uh, paint strokes, uh, but also they're going to intentionally um, use colors uh, abstractly. So they will intentionally, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, use of unconventional colors, color schemes, and they're going to use this, uh, these sort of abstract colors, abstract color and form to uh, convey, uh, convey or express meaning. So I'll show you a couple examples on the, on the screen. Um, but uh, they're going to use uh, different shades and colors that you, than you would normally use for like the human. So uh, the human face and, and features and houses and skies and things like that. So you normally think about, you know, how humans look and how the sky looks and how the landscape looks. And they'll take those forms and they'll make them a little distorted and they'll change the color. Kind of like back in um, uh, period one with mannerists that would intentionally... Uh, distort the features of humans and the color to, to, to convey a, me a meaning. They're going to do the exact same thing. So it's going to be a similar style, uh, and they're still going to keep those those emphasis on, on, on sometimes anyway, movement and lighting, certainly the lighting, but they're going to intentionally use unconventional, uh, slightly distorted shapes and um, unconventional, um, almost opposite, not opposite necessarily, but different colors than you normally would to uh, to uh, to fill in some of the things that they, that they focus on. All right, last one is, you know, color, cubism. And that's going to bring us into uh, World War I, where we are going to see things change even more. So from the uh, late 1900s, like, we'll say like 1910-ish, on to the 1920s, so somewhere in here, uh, we have the movement called cubism. Cubism, and I'm sure you've all heard of Picasso, um, is a... Uh, largely driven uh, by Picasso and other painters, but he's by far the most famous. Uh, and Cubism itself is going to be in the black because my, my purple pen's going out. Cubism is, uh, if this is the transition to modern art by using abstract themes and trying to convey different meanings, uh, Cubism's like you've arrived at modern art. This is now completely different than anything ever we've seen before. Um, these are uh, a transition to that. Uh, definitely the beginning of modern art here, but by the time you reach Cubism, it's no longer even recognizable as far as uh, previous uh, art movements. And they do it intentionally, and it lines up with, and so does post impression but certainly Cubism lines up with these scientific and philosophical beliefs that have just rejected any concept of a universal truth or perspective that's even possible. So, um, and most of that's on the foundational levels of, of speed and size and all of that. 
uh, or, or beliefs for philosophy. So Cubism intentionally plays on that, um, or at least represents it, by uh, uh, characterizing itself as a characterized Um, simple geometric shapes and forms, and that doesn't really help you, I'm sure. Obviously, the cube part of cubism, there's a lot of uh, rough edges, but they'll paint these, uh, or paint these paintings or make these sculptures that are using a lot of simple shapes and forms and rigid things, and they're putting them together to kind of look like something, but it doesn't exactly look like something. So the question becomes, is that supposed to be a lady playing a violin, or is it something entirely differently? Um, you can certainly look at it from multiple perspectives and angles and see different things, or at least think different things about the message. It's unclear, and it's intentionally unclear. So it's a very vague, opaque, uh, ambiguous uh, painting or meaning in, in many cases, and they do that intentionally because they don't want to have one specific meaning. They want you to, be able to look at it and draw other perspectives and meanings from it. So uh, simple geometric shapes and forms, and uh, a break from a clear single perspective or meaning. Uh, instead, they're going to focus on a multitude of perspectives and meaning. I'll show you some examples, but um, I can, I think, borrow from psychology uh, for an example. Here. Oh, by the way, one more famous artist, the most famous artist, I could just say, pretty... Uh, confidently, Pablo Picasso. And his work is gonna, he's gonna go all the way to the 1970s in his work, maybe in the 80s, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but he's certainly gonna go to 1910s to 1970s, maybe 80s as far as his actual work, how his lifespan, his actual work. Um, he did sculptures and, and statues in Chicago, because he was all over the place. Um, so I'll show you some examples, of course, but what I kind of mean is, if I just paint a painting of a rabbit, uh, just sitting there eating a carrot or just by itself, with nothing else really going around it, it'd be pretty cool that I'm just painting a rabbit, right? Maybe I can distort things, maybe to make them a little impressionist or post-impressionist, but it's like, yeah, that's a rabbit. But if I have something like this, and I'm borrowing from AP Psych, but I think it'll work. So here's my canvas, and I might not do this very well, but I'm gonna try. So here's a nice, simple geometric shape. There's a nice, simple geometric shape. Another simple geometric shape. There's one. There's one, here's one there, there's one there, there's one there. Okay, so there's my geometric shapes. It's like, whoa, what is that? Let me add to this actually. Okay, so there's my geometric shape. So you might look at it and be like, actually, let me fix this for a second. You might look at it and be like, oh, I see a rabbit, and you could uh, probably get other people to agree that there's a rabbit in there. This kind of looks like a rabbit looking up uh, and out. And you're like, okay, fair enough. But is that the only thing it could be? You might be able to look at it from a different perspective um, and see something else. And sure enough, if you also look, it might be harder to see, but you could also see potentially like some sort of flying bird here. So here's the beak, there's the eye, the head, the neck, and there's its wings outstretched and it's flying in uh, to or over something. Uh, so that one is less clear as to what uh, I mean. I can even title it something ambiguous like the animal. And then it's like, well, I don't even know what is that supposed to be. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a psychological phenomenon known as perceptual constancy, but uh, it still works here for, for getting the point across. So simple geometric shapes and shades, uh, and it's, it might even seem like it has a single perspective or meaning, but it intentionally doesn't, uh, that you can look at it multiple ways and apply multiple meanings. And again, that coincides very, very well with um, uh, special relativity, special relativity, man, I can't say it, special relativity, especially uh, because um, that one is, is, of course, subjective to the observer when they're traveling at um, high speeds. So that is essentially uh, 19th century culture, early 20th century culture. Some people call it the long 19th century, I think accurately, from about 1970, sorry, 1789 to 1914, kind of the French Revolution to World War I, um, where culture does, does change, but it's got a lot of very common themes, and they definitely change uh, by 1914 and going onward. But that's where it is at period three, and for 2020, 
that's all you need to know. Uh, those of you that are taking this class after <clears throat> uh, next year, 2020, 2021, uh, you will be looking for the period four videos, but the rest of you are done, so there it is.